Really, no exaggeration. When you go in Tunisia for a holiday, you don't see the dark side. And I can give you a number of examples. One of the worst was Tunisia. You know, we had agreed with the Tunisian authorities that we would pray Salah Jummah in a place called Madanin. When we reached Madanin, they had blocked the city. They blocked the entrance to the city. And they said, you have to pray further on. 12 kilometers further on. When we asked the local, they said there is no masjid 12 kilometers further on. And we had got used to them, you know, trying to not allow us to pray Salah. So what the local subhanallah did, is that they encircled us. And they said that you're going to pray Salah here. Now you can understand the bravery of these locals, because these are the countries when America wants to, you know, torture somebody. This is where they send them. And they encircled us. And they said, they're going to pray Jummah here. Now the brothers left the decision to me. So the masjid was only 200 meters away. We could have moved the barriers and prayed Salah and most likely got arrested and the BBC would have had a field day. Nati Muslim convoy storms town. <laughs> so I decided to go and speak to the police officer in charge and I said look you have one of two options either you allow us to pray Salah in the masjid and I give you undertaking that nobody from the convoy will speak to any of the locals they will pray Salah and they will come back or the other option is that we will pray Salah and we will pray and we will pray out here and we have press TV with us and the world will see that you stopped an aid convoy going to Gaza from praying Juma Salah. So for three days, this guy had continuously been on the phone. So he looked at me like this, turned around and he took out his phone. And he spoke to his superiors, obviously they told him we can't. So we prayed Juma outside. And Alhamdulillah, many of the locals joined us. And then I gave a speech and it was translated as well, so they could hear it. And all along, these policemen kept on saying, we're Muslims. We're Muslims, but none of them joined us in the prayer. And I told them in the speech, I said, I said, we travel through Europe, non-Muslim countries. Nobody stopped us from entering a masjid. And we enter a Muslim country and you stop us from praying? So what kind of people are you? We finished Salah and we left. Now generally what they would do, they would take us from you know, outside the city, the roads that go around the city. The final city in Tunisia, the road went through the town. They had no option. So they didn't want us to reach this city at Maghrib time. So what they began to do was drive at 15 miles an hour. Can you imagine a convoy over a mile long, over 100 vehicles driving at 15 miles an hour? Maghrib time came, we stopped the vehicles and we prayed. After Maghrib, they shut off. When we hit this town, our vehicle was the third vehicle in the convoy. And I told Brother Manzuru were driving, I said, drop it down to 10, km, 10 miles an hour. Subhanallah, when we reached this place, forget about 10 miles an hour, the locals had come out in such force that they had blocked all the streets. And they were pulling us out of our vehicles and saying, you're going you're gonna to stay here tonight. Nowhere did the police try as hard. And nowhere did we get a reception like we did. As Allah says in the Quran, Makaru wa makar Allah, wallahu khayrul makirin. They plan and they plot and Allah plans and Allah is the best of planners. From there, we went to Libya. Libya was the only Muslim country which welcomed us, which allowed us to speak freely to the general public. When we went across the border, they had a grand reception for us. They treated us very well. When we went to Tripoli, they had a huge reception for us. They allowed us to speak to the general public. They fed us very well, they looked after us, and they gave another hundred lorries, double lorries, with the convoy. And in every city, 
they had prepared a reception, every major city. But because we were running behind schedule, the convoy should have taken 16 days, it took 23 days, brothers had to get back to work. So what we did is that halfway through the country, we cut through the Sahara Desert. 400 kilometers of Sahara Desert, only one service station. If you're by yourself, you break down, it's you, Allah, the snakes and the scorpions. <laughs> and let me tell you about some of the reception that we received in Libya. Two of our vehicles decided to go ahead of the rest of the convoy. And we parked in a, a cafe which had the petrol station next to it. And, we, and before that we prayed Maghrib Salah. When we came out of the masjid, some brothers came out and they said, look, we want you to stay with us tonight. You know, we, it'd be an honor for us. And we said, we apologize because we're with the convoy. So we went ahead and we parked in a, a cafe which was next to a petrol station. And we had no local currency. So we spoke to the owner and he said, fine, give me euros. We were sitting there, we ordered our food. A brother came in and he paid for it. Five minutes later, wallahi, another brother came in and he wanted to pay for it. Owner told him somebody else already paid. The brother in the masjid had followed us and he bought two bags of food for us and he gave it to us. And then we needed fuel, we had no local currency and we went to the petrol station. We said, will you take euros? He said, we don't take euros. And there was a brother standing there. Wallahi, you should have seen his car. You know, nobody in England would drive such a car. And he was listening to this. And he said, give me the honor of filling up your tanks. And he filled up both of our tanks and then he gave us double money to fill them up again. And all this happened in a period of about an hour. This is kind of reception that the people gave. It wasn't because, you know, we did something amazing. It was because these people love the Palestinian cause. It was that, it was because they love the Palestinian cause. From Libya we went to Egypt. Egypt we knew was always going to be problematic. Egypt has the rougher border, it's close ally with Israel, it gets a lot of aid from America, but we really didn't think it was going to be that bad. They quickly got us over the border, they made us into groups of 20, and they kept four brothers behind on trumped up charges of national security. We didn't realize until we had gone a hundred kilometers and then we realized they had kept four brothers behind. I think some of the brothers might even be here today. Yeah, some of the Mujahids are here today, mashallah. And let me tell you one thing, you know, Wallahi, the brothers, the four brothers, you know, it was very difficult for me because by that time I had been chosen as the Mir of the convoy. And you know, the brothers rang me and they said, Shaykh, Wallahi, any decision you make, if you tell us now, to jump on the plane, we will jump on the plane and we will go home. This is after three weeks journey. You know, you have a deep emotional relationship with, with the convoy. And they phoned me and they said, Sheikh, they were the first people to say, Sheikh, whatever you decide, we will do. We will jump on the plane and we will go back home. May Allah reward them. If I told you that the Egyptians used about 10,000 men on us, on that aid convoy, this would be no exaggeration. 10,000 men. They had riot police with us, they had police dogs with us. We drove for 1600 kilometers through Egypt. Less than every 100 meters, they would have a man standing. Day, night, city, desert, rain or shine, they would have a person standing there. And he wouldn't be facing us, he would be actually facing the other side. So nobody would come and greet us. This is how paranoid these people are. This is how paranoid they are. And in the middle of nowhere, they would have these tents erected, far from general population. And they would have their media and their you know, delegates there. And they would have a huge picture of Husni Mubarak. And then they would get one of us to give a speech, ideally if it was George or somebody else they could find. And then, you know, we would go again and they would say things like, you know, we regard ourselves as Palestinians and the Egyptians regard the Palestinians as Egyptians. 
and the Rafa border has never been closed. This is what they would say, Rafa border has never been closed. 